and what time restricted eating is doing is it's helping to organize their clockwork now that it's better organized it's also aligning delivery of nutrients with when those clocks will better respond to those nutrients welcome to the seam Lund podcast i'm your host seam Lund, and our guest today is dr greg potter greg has a phd in the leeds university of cardiovascular and metabolic medicine this is the second part to our discussion about chronobiology In our first episode, we talked about sleep and fixing sleep problems. In this episode, we're going to focus on chrononutrition and time-restricted eating. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, formerly known as Blue Blocks. My favorite light and sleep optimization companies, Blue Blocks, has rebranded themselves as Bond Charge. They're now involved with a huge range of evidence-based products to improve your wellness and life in every way. Their extensive range of premium wellness products helps you to sleep better, perform better, have more energy, recover faster, balance your hormones, and reduce inflammation. My favorites are the red light light bulbs, because they can be used to create a melatonin-friendly environment in your bedroom by shining only red and not blue or green light waves that will reduce your sleep quality. After starting to use these red light light bulbs, I find it much easier to fall asleep and feel less awake before bed. If you want to try out these amazing products that are the cornerstones to my most optimal sleep, then head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code seam15 to save 15%. Greg, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Seam. Always a pleasure to speak. Yes, uh, we decided to do like a follow-up to our previous conversation because we only managed to cover sleep and uh, fixing like chronic uh, sleep problems and stuff like that. So we never really got into chrononutrition and chronopharmacology which is one new like a concept that you introduced me to as well in the previous talk so yeah i'm just glad to continue on with our discussion fantastic yeah looking forward to it so like what you know we we will obviously want to lay some sort of a framework um so what is chrono nutrition and how does it relate to you know the circadian rhythms and uh, sleep or maybe like just overall health I would think about chrononutrition as using an understanding of your body's circadian biology to improve how you respond to the foods and drinks that you consume. And as is often the case in the world of circadian biology and biological rhythms in general, there's a two-way relationship between these two variables. And what I mean by that is that what and when you eat can affect your body's clocks and therefore your biological rhythms but also your body's clocks and biological rhythms affect how you respond to those foods and drinks and so what we're trying to do is improve variables such as our cardiometabolic health by better understanding when we should eat certain foods when we should drink certain items And I think this is a really important subject because if you look at how most people eat, they spread out their food intake over quite a long period each day. There's not that much research on this, but if you look in countries such as the USA, then it's common for people to spread out their intake of calorie containing items over more than 14 hours per day on average. And that might contribute to deterioration in the function of their body's clocks over time and in turn deterioration in their general health and well-being and based on recent science we know that if people can change when they consume certain items they can improve many aspects of their biology and the good news is that most people can actually make these changes because one of the issues in the world of nutrition science is that Often people fundamentally understand what they need to be doing. They need to eat more fruits and vegetables. They need to drink more water, but they struggle to make those changes. And when it comes to managing certain chronic health conditions, so take the example of type 2 diabetes. In a situation in which somebody goes to visit their medical doctor and they've got 15 minutes with her, and the medical doctor is trying to convey information about how to change what they eat to improve their blood sugar control, saying, oh, you should reduce your carbohydrate intake and maybe you should favor lower glycemic load foods. A lot of people won't understand the actual advice. In the case of chronic nutrition interventions, though, people understand what they should be doing. If you just say to somebody, I want you to 
only eat and drink within a regular period of eight to 10 hours each day. And you can choose when that window is. So if it was eight hours, then it could be between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. People mm. understand it and people seem to be able to stick to it relatively consistently. The numbers vary, but people can probably stick to it something like 60% of the time going by the most recent data. And importantly, people don't seem to need to stick to the guidance all of the time to realize some benefits. Mm. So it's more like a diet adherence uh, principle or a way to make sure that you don't overeat and uh, also just, you know, implement some other healthier eating habits by doing that. Yeah, I think there are a few facts at play. So if we take the example of time-restricted eating, and I'll define that as restricting your intake of anything that contains more than five calories over a period of less than 12 hours each day. Commonly, this might be practiced as an eight to 10 hour eating window, which I think is doable for most people and likely to yield some health benefits. Then when people can stick to that over time, they seem to change a few things. So first, they obviously change when they eat, but they also seem to slightly change what they eat too. And the research on this is somewhat mixed, but if you look, for example, at some work that was done by Elizabeth Thomas and her colleagues last year, then they found that when people implemented time-restricted eating, they improved their healthy eating indices. This is just an index of somebody's diet quality. And when you think about the different foods and drinks that you consume each day, we tend to favor certain items at certain times of day. I always say that not that many people are drinking wine at breakfast and not that many people are eating cereal at dinner. Mm. And so if somebody is reducing their eating window, and in particular, they're finishing their daily calorie intake earlier in the day, they're probably less likely to then indulge in some of the lower quality items that a lot of us favor at night. Because interestingly, there's a circadian rhythm in appetite such that it tends to peak at around 8 p.m. for a lot of people. And so after a hard day at work, when we're a bit ego depleted and we're prone to making bad decisions and we've got a high appetite drive, we're more likely to reach for biscuits and ice cream and to drink wine. But if we're using time-restricted eating and we have stopped consuming any calories by 7 p.m., then we might consume fewer of those items and in turn improve our diet quality. And when people stick to this, they seem to improve their health in several ways. So if you look at the meta-analyses that have been done, there have been a few. One that I liked was done by Shinji Moon and colleagues a few years ago, and they found that looking across many different studies, people on average slightly reduce their body weight. They slightly reduce their fasting blood sugar. They reduce their triglycerides. They lowered their systolic blood pressure too. And the sizes of these effects are quite modest, but importantly, these are studies in which people aren't told to eat less, but they do eat less. And when you look at what control groups are doing when they don't receive any dietary advice, a lot of the time, those different outcomes that I just mentioned have gone in the wrong direction over the same period of time. So, so like, is there is those benefits coming from the calorie restriction, or there is there any anything unique to? the restriction of the eating window uh, in terms of like the health outcomes? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And it's one that has been addressed in several ways. And I'll mention both preclinical research of non-human animals and studies of humans too. So starting with the preclinical research, the work that I found most compelling includes work done years ago by Fred Churek and his colleagues showing that compared to rodents that are fed during their active phase when they would normally be running around, which for these rodents was the dark period, when they only have access to food intake during their inactive phase, which is the light phase for these nocturnal animals, they gain more weight despite consuming an equivalent number of calories. And that has to do with how their body's clocks are regulating their metabolic responses to food intake. But maybe the best demonstration of the importance of timing of food intake per se 
in my opinion, in non-human animals was by Victoria Costa Rodriguez and Joe Takahashi quite recently. See, you probably saw this study, but it's a beautiful study. And I'm generally very critical of metabolic research on non-human animals because people are quick to extrapolate it to humans, assuming that what happens in mice translates to us, and often that's not the case. But what they did in this work was they split mice into several different groups and they had an ad lib fed group. They also had different forms of calorie restriction. And I won't go into all the details of the groups, but basically what they found was that by comparing calorie restriction without any sort of time restriction to calorie restriction with time restriction, Calorie restriction alone prolonged the animal's lifespans by a modest amount. It was about 10%. Whereas the combination of calorie restriction plus time restriction increased their lifespans quite dramatically. It was by over 30%. And so it seems that it's not necessarily just the fact that using time-restricted eating is reducing food intake that's yielding these benefits, but also it's the fact that it's aligning food intake with biological rhythms and maybe helping to improve biological rhythms in terms of their amplitude and their stability mm. that is producing these benefits and then going to the human research and i won't go into much depth here maybe the most relevant studies are the ones that have compared early time restricted eating to later forms of time restricted eating and this is another instance where there's not a good definition of this, but the working definition that I use is that early time restricted eating is finishing your final calorie intake of the day by at least five hours before your bedtime. So if your bedtime was 10 p.m., that would be finishing by at least 5 p.m. And these studies, there have been a few of them with somewhat mixed results, but they've tended to show that early time restricted eating produces greater benefits than later time restricted eating. The effect sizes aren't massive, but I'll mention a couple of these studies. I think maybe the best of these have been done by Courtney Peterson and Yile Mao. Courtney Peterson, she did a lot of the early work on early time restricted eating in humans, published some work in 2018 showing that in men with pre-diabetes, doing five weeks of early time restricted eating and controlling their food intake so they didn't lose body weight, substantially dropped their blood pressure by about 10 millimeters of mercury, which is a big effect size. It improved their blood sugar control and their insulin sensitivity, and it reduced the marks of oxidative stress. But more recently, she's shown that compared to later time restricted eating, early time restricted eating in overweight and obese adults more dramatically reduce their body weight. And then Yile Mao and colleagues from China found that comparing early time restricted eating to later time restricted eating and a control group that didn't use any time restricted eating, the later time restricted eating did lead some benefits over the course of several months, but the early time restricted eating led to greater reductions in body weight, fat mass, blood sugar control, so greater improvements in blood sugar control and also reduce some markers of chronic inflammation such as TNF-alpha and increased gut microbiota alpha diversity. So mm. I think so far, the weight of the evidence suggests that there is some advantage to time restriction per se that is independent of calorie intake. And we can go into some of the mechanisms by which that might be taking place. Right. So it's like you can see some health benefits with a confined eating window and more specifically with an early time restricted eating window, even if you don't like lose weight or even if you're not eating less calories and those benefits are might be, might not be like super big, but they are there like a small benefit to having just a smaller eating window, even if the calories are the same. I think that's right. If we're speaking about the majority of people, there are a few things to bear in mind. So one of them is just that the worse your cardiometabolic health is at baseline, mm. the greater the size of the benefits that you're likely to experience. Gotcha. So this... you're like, because you're already like suffering from these, you know, ex the excess oxidative stress and inflammation, and then just eating less often, like reduces that burden kind of slightly. 
Yeah, we also know that various different disease states are associated with abnormalities in the biological clockwork. And obviously the specifics depend on the disease in question, but you see this both in terms of the biological processes and the behaviors that take place. So take the example of some neurodegenerative diseases. There's a phenomenon called sundowning where people have substantially worse symptoms around dusk so they might become very irritable for example so you see change in their behavior at that time of day mm -hmm. but you also see changes in various different metabolic relevant organs in metabolic diseases such as diabetes so you might see abnormalities in the clocks in people's skeletal muscles and the adipose tissue for example and so it's likely that time restricted eating is improving the function of some of these peripheral clocks, which are all of those clocks outside of the master clock in the brain, which is particularly important to the sleep wake cycle and its regularity. And so it, based on what I just said, I, I think that time restricted eating is probably improving the clock function of these people, but also early time restricted eating is specifically aligning their food intake with when some of these peripheral clocks are best set for certain processes. So just to mention a couple of these processes, if you look at oral glucose tolerance, so how much your blood sugar swings in response to a standardized bolus of glucose and in a glucose tolerance test, this is usually 75 grams of glucose. It's substantially better in the biological morning so at about 8 a.m for most people than it is in the biological evening at about 8 p.m the difference is probably about 17 percent we've controlled for other factors and that's due to many factors there are changes for example in various functions within the pancreas itself the beta cells that produce insulin have their own biological clocks that influence that insulin production skeletal muscle clocks will influence glucose disposal at the level of the muscles. Clocks in adipocytes, fat cells, have an intrinsic clockwork that influences things like levels of adiponectin, such that insulin sensitivity is highest in fat cells at about 12 p.m. for most people. And so what early time-restricted eating is doing is ensuring that food is coming in when the gastrointestinal system is best set to digest that food and you see within the gut change and things like various nutrient transporters and the integrity of the lining of the gut, as well as changes in the microbiota themselves and some of the metabolites that they produce are things like short chain fatty acids, which then influence the integrity of the intestinal lining. And then you see those changes in glucose control in response to the factors that I just mentioned. And maybe related to all of this, there are substantial changes in immune function across the day and the night as a result of clock-driven alterations. And that's very relevant to food intake because when you think about your active period, when you're awake, and moving around and eating each day, then that activity increases your exposure to lots of different pathogens. And for that reason, you want stronger activity in various different facets of your immune system at that time of day to ward off those pathogens. And given that when you eat food, you're increasing your exposure to them, it's really important that you see some immune changes within the gastrointestinal system itself. And sure enough, those changes to take place. And this is relevant to other factors, of course, such as how you respond to vaccinations. Maybe we'll get to this later, but just as a demonstration of these clock-driven changes in immune function, we know that people seem to produce more antibodies in response to vaccinations such as influenza and BCG when the vaccinations are given in the morning than later in the day. So mm. I realize that I've gone off on a bit of a tangent there, Seam. Right. But basically, there are lots of abnormalities in the biological clockwork of people with various different metabolic pathologies. And what time-restricted eating is doing is it's helping to organize their clockwork. And now that it's better organized, it's also aligning the delivery of nutrients with when those clocks will better respond to those nutrients. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the body has its own the circadian rhythms and uh, variations in different processes depending on the time of the day and you know if you misalign those clocks with eating at the wrong time or eating at that like less optimal time then you will see like 
worse outcomes it's just it makes common sense in that sense and you know for humans the circadian rhythm is is more geared towards being like earlier uh, circadian rhythm like first of all we're not like mice or rats who have a nocturnal uh, chronotype that they are actually their daytime activity or you know their active period is at night and they sleep in uh, daytime whereas in humans it's the op opposite and you know that's why eating earlier in the day as well as not eating at night is the optimal way for humans because if you like look at shift work and stuff like that then this mi misalignment with due to light exposure and sleeping patterns is associated with these diseases but i would imagine that eating at night and eating uh, in in, a, in opposition to the natural human circadian rhythm would just cause also these kind of similar diseases as you see in uh, shift work yeah i think that's likely one of the factors that's at play and i mentioned a couple of things in response to what you just said one is that we shouldn't be thinking about when we eat relative to the social clock the clock that's on your wall we should be thinking about it relative to the timing of our own individual biological clocks. And it's currently difficult to measure these in an accurate way using things like existing wearables that are used by consumers. And I think the most practical proxy that we have of the timing of these clocks, at least for non-shift workers, is the timing of our sleep-wake cycle. And so when we're thinking about the best time of day at which we should be eating as individuals, we should be thinking about it relative to our sleep-wake cycle. And we should also be considering things like whether we wake up to an alarm clock in the morning. Because if you wake to an alarm, say, two hours before you would naturally wake up, then you're waking yourself from your biological nighttime. And therefore, even though it's early in your waking day, it's still your biological nighttime and therefore your body is probably best not, it's not best set for food intake at that particular time. And so for a night owl who goes to bed at 3 a.m., for them, early time restricted eating might be finishing their food intake by 10 p.m. at <laughs> the latest, which for a lot of us would be bedtime. Going on to shift work, an important point to make is that outside of exceptional circumstances, for example, people who work on oil rigs where these people have very controlled light cycles and they're more or less completely isolated from the rest of humanity, most shift workers don't adapt to their shift schedules. So if they work night shifts, even if they work night shifts in the long term, so they're chronic night shift workers, their body's clocks don't seem to have fully adapted to their shift schedules. So their clocks are still actually set quite a lot earlier than their sleep-wake cycles. And so based on that, for these people, the timing of their food intake should arguably probably be a bit earlier relative to their sleep-wake cycles that are enforced by their shifts, if that makes sense. And I think the most relevant studies that have been done on this subject, studies of humans, are some by Frank Shear, and he and his colleagues published some terrific work just in the last couple of years showing that when people undergo simulated night shifts, if they restrict their access to food to the daytime, then they have better blood sugar control than if they eat later. And so even though these people are awake during the nighttime, they actually pin their food intake to the daytime and they maintain better blood sugar control. And interestingly, that seems to relate to better internal coordination of timing within their body's clocks. There's less so-called internal misalignment between when they're eating and the timing of the master clock in the brain. So for some shift workers, that could actually mean eating much of their food intake during the daytime, even though they're working night shifts and trying to maintain as regular eating window as possible. And then they sub subsequently published some work showing that interestingly, when people did this, they kept that type of daytime eating schedule despite simulated night shift work. They had better mood ratings too they had less anxiety and depressive symptoms gotcha 
So what is like for the average person, what would be their window of op- optimal food intake? Like when is safe to eat and when should, you know, they shouldn't eat for a person who, you know, the average person wakes up maybe around 6 to 8 a.m., goes to bed around 10 to 11 p.m. Sure. Let's, for example, use someone that wakes up at 7 a.m., goes to bed at 11 p.m., and they wake up at 7 a.m. feeling well-rested. Maybe they wake to an alarm, but they certainly wouldn't be in bed much longer after that. I think for that person, waiting at least an hour before opening their eating window for the day, their daily caloric period, which is what I would refer to it as, makes a lot of sense because when they first wake, they're at the transition between their biological nighttime when melatonin is high and their biological daytime. We know, for example, that melatonin will worsen people's blood sugar responses to meals. It reduces glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. And interestingly, the degree to which that happens seems to depend on somebody's genetics and specifically one of the genes that encodes one of the receptors for melatonin. So wait at least an hour after waking. Then I think the duration of the eating window should probably be anywhere between about six and 12 hours for most people. And if your starting eating window is 14 hours, as is true of many people, you don't have to jump from 14 hours to say nine hours. And instead you can slowly reduce the duration of that eating window. So you can go from 14 hours to 13 hours, 12 hours to 11 hours, to 10 hours until you find something that's restrictive but also sustainable regarding whether six hours, the low end of that range or 12 hours is best. I think it depends on a few factors. One of them obviously is whether somebody can stick to it. One of them is somebody's goals. If your goal is weight loss and fat loss, then arguably favoring the shorter or the lower end of that range make some sense because there does seem to be something of a dose response relationship between the duration of the eating window and the total number of calories that people consume each day. So if you are trying to lose fat at a very fast rate, then you might favor six to eight hours. For example, if you can sustain that another group of people who might be more interested in using a short, window like this is people on the ketogenic diet so going back to courtney peterson her and eric Ravison have done some work showing that using early time restricted eating can increase next day ketone levels in the blood so if you're struggling to get into ketosis and you're using a ketogenic diet diet to manage some sort of medical condition whether that's obesity or diabetes or epilepsy you might want to try and use a relatively short window. For people who are just looking to generally be healthy and modestly reduce their food intake, maybe they're looking to lose a small amount of fat and gain a little bit of muscle at the same time. I think eight to 10 hours works really well. And then if you're trying to maintain your body weight or if you're trying to gain weight while staying healthy, or if you're just prone to losing weight in general, as is true of lots of people who are very active, then I'd probably favor the upper end of that range. So maybe 10 to 12 hours each day. And regarding when to close that window by, I think everybody should probably look to close it certainly at least two hours before bed, ideally at least three hours before bed. I don't really think there are many exceptions to that maybe outside of people who have a history of very low energy availability. So some people listening to this will be familiar with the concept of relative energy deficiency in sport, for instance, red S. And that is a condition in which people just haven't been eating enough food for a long period of time, despite high activity levels. And that has resulted in various symptoms, which could include things like low bone mineral density and therefore predisposition to fractures. It could, could include loss of the menstrual cycle. If we're speaking about women of reproductive age, It could include low libido if you're male and maybe erectile dysfunction. So people who are prone to low energy availability, I wouldn't necessarily recommend time-restricted eating for them. 
but they i think they could use it i would probably just go with that 12 hour mark for those individuals and then staying on the subject of who this isn't necessarily for i think there is debate about whether it makes sense for people who are growing so just take the example of children they often need a lot of food to support high rates of growth and so whether it's ideal for these people we don't really know my suspicion is that 10 to 12 hours work really well for kids and be perfectly healthy for them but that research hasn't been done and so i i just don't think that we know what's best yet and also i'd be reluctant to provide specific dietary guidance to young people in general another group would be pregnant women and pregnant women are an example of a group who everyone is terrified of giving advice to because nobody wants to be held liable for any <laughs> malpractice but again we don't know what's best for them but what is clear is that what and when mum eats influences what and when the infants receive their food their nutrients so based on that i think there are good reasons to think that maintaining regular eating cycles is going to help support the emergence of a functional clock in the infant and if you look for example at nursing women so women who are breastfeeding then what they eat will influence the composition of the breast milk but their general circadian hygiene so things like when they're exposed to light and darkness will also affect the timing and composition of the milk that they express and the relevance of that is that if for instance you are breastfeeding during the night time you'd want to try and do so in a dim environment and probably ideally expose yourself to red light as opposed to other light colors at that time, because that's going to disrupt your clock less. It's going to, it's going to reduce, it's going to minimally affect the amount of melatonin that you're producing and therefore the melatonin in your breast milk. And that's helping to send strong time cues to the infant that is nursing at that time. So it's helping your baby have a functional clock and it's therefore helping them have sleep wake cycles that are reasonable, which in turn is going to improve your own sleep because they're not going to be up during the night as much, if that makes sense. Mm. So I think those are some general time restricted eating recommendations that work well for most people. But then within that eating window, we can get into some specifics regarding how it's best to allocate different macronutrients. Mm. Yeah, I was going to think about that next as well. But before we go there, I'll maybe like briefly summarize that, you know, there's there's not a lot of, let's say, advantages to having a smaller eating window, you know, compared to six to 12 hours. But there is certainly advantages to having a eating window less than 12 hours than having it over 12 hours, if that makes sense. Like if you eat like the standard American, like over the course of 16 hours and and you pretty much only never eat when you're sleeping then that's clearly not optimal for the circadian rhythm and the circadian clocks and uh, it also may cause like metabolic harm even even without the excess calorie intake like of course if you have 16 hour eating window you're going to eat more calories more than likely but even then if you don't even if you're like in a maintenance calorie intake then even then there might be some you know the circadian clock dysregulation and in so doing you also like you know, have some worse metabolic profile as a result of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think to summarize, less than 12 hours is better than longer than 12 hours for most people. 10 hours is probably a bit better than 12 hours for most. Eight hours might be marginally better than 10 hours. Whether six hours is better than eight hours really depends on the individual. And for some people, it's probably actually going to be worse because it's going to reduce their food intake when that is not the desired outcome. Oh, sorry no <laughs> but what about but uh what about the macros then like what is the most optimal time to eat these different macros protein carbs and fats is there any circadian aspect yeah i think there certainly is to some of them we don't know that much about some of the macronutrients though the one that we best understand in my opinion is carbohydrate 
And if you factor out physical activity, then in general, based on some of those changes that are taking place in different organ systems at different times of day that I touched on earlier, front loading carbohydrate intake within the day works well for a lot of people. And so practically that might mean consuming much of your daily carbohydrate intake within your first couple of meals if you're eating three or four meals each day. There are a few factors to consider. One of them is physical activity, because if, for example, you go for a walk of at least 15 minutes after eating, then you're going to dramatically push down your blood sugar as a result of having just consumed food. And so if you do consume a substantial amount of carbohydrate late in the day when your body is less effective at digesting, metabolizing that carbohydrate, then just going for a short walk after meals can help you keep your blood sugar responses to those meals in check. And then also, while it's on my mind, the sequence in which you consume items at individual meals and snacks can quite strongly affect your blood sugar responses to those meals. And in general, if you consume the carbohydrate rich items at the end of meals, so those carbohydrate rich items include things like potatoes, sweet potatoes, fruits, starchy vegetables, and also grains and pulses, then you're going to have better blood sugar control than if you start meals with those items. A lot of that work's been done by a lady named Alpana Shukla. And again, this is probably more relevant to people with poor metabolic control than people with good metabolic control. But when practical, I think start your meals and snacks with fiber, fat, and protein-rich items. And a practical way to do that can just be to have a salad at the start of meals, which is a common practice in many different cultures. Moving on to protein, this really isn't so well understood. There's been a little bit of research done on rodents suggesting that breakfast might be particularly anabolic in skeletal muscle. And in some ways, muscles are more receptive to protein at that time of day, which does make some sense. If you think about the fact that following the overnight fast, you haven't had nutrients coming in for a period of time. But I don't know whether that means that breakfast should necessarily be higher in protein than other meals. You might also think about that final meal of the day where you're about to go into an overnight fast when your skeletal muscles don't have any protein coming in and having a large bolus of protein at that time might help maintain muscle protein balance longer into the overnight fast. So I think that it probably makes most sense to distribute your protein intake relatively evenly across meals each day. But if anything, your first and final meal are particularly important. And when you look at how most people eat, a lot of people will tend to have very little protein at breakfast. So there's a really easy win to be had just by increasing breakfast protein intake. And it's very clear that that improves metabolic control and appetite regulation over the rest of the day too because people think about protein as just being for skeletal muscles and obviously it's really important to that but when you consume protein you also will increase your production of hormones like glp1 which will improve your blood sugar responses to meals they will also affect your appetite such that protein is the most satiating per calorie of the different macronutrients protein also has a higher thermic effect of feeding it leads to more diet induced thermogenesis than carbohydrate or fat. So it's particularly important if you're trying to lose body fat or reduce your food intake and lose weight. So just adding some protein to breakfast, and that might mean consuming eggs, high protein dairy like yogurt or cheese or even milk if you eat if you drink milk. It might mean adding some fish to your breakfast. It could mean including a protein shake. A lot of the research done on the subject is looked at whey protein but some of the plant proteins that combine pea and rice so plant proteins that have complementary amino acid profiles show that they can also be beneficial and then regarding your fat intake we really don't understand the subject very well what we do know is that in general consuming a relatively small amount of daily energy intake late in the day 
seems to be good for metabolic health. So if you are on a very low carbohydrate diet, let's say you're on a ketogenic diet to manage their health condition, I think for you, it still makes sense to consume a small dinner. And given that so much of your daily energy intake is going to be coming from fat, that's going to be the lowest fat meal too. And then the other macronutrient, of course, is alcohol. And this probably isn't relevant to many listeners if they're health conscious, but I'll mention it just in case. And with alcohol earlier really is better. And breakfast is the best time for beer. So (laughs) the reasons for that include the fact that alcohol seems to disrupt sleep in several ways. One, One of them is that it's a muscle relaxant and so it exacerbates snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. One of them is that it's diuretic. So people will pee more after drinking alcohol, which is going to fragment their sleep. But it also seems to directly affect sleep architecture such that early in the sleep period, people spend a greater proportion of their sleep in the deeper stage of sleep. But then later in the sleep period, their sleep is lighter, more fragmented and tends to contain less rapid eye movement sleep, which we spoke a little bit about in the last podcast. So with alcohol, I think a reasonable recommendation for a lot of people is to think about this in terms of units of alcohol and there are resources out there like drink aware that people can refer to to get an idea of the alcohol unit content of common drinks but to give you an idea a pint of beer is about two units and a medium glass of wine is about two units too and i think it makes sense to try and finish your alcohol intake for the day, obviously within your eating window, but then thinking about it in terms of units, it will be at least one hour before bedtime per unit consumed plus one hour. So if you've just consumed four units, you've just had two pints of beer, then one hour per unit, that'd be four times one, so four hours plus one hour, you'd want to finish those two pints of beer at least five hours before bedtime if you don't want the beer to disrupt your sleep substantially. People differ substantially in the rates at which they detoxify alcohol, but I think that works well for a lot of people. But but just bear in mind that if you don't drink often at all and you occasionally go out with friends and have a few drinks late in the evening, then it's no big deal because most of the time you're doing things well. Hmm. Yeah, that's very insightful. And I wanted to mention about the breakfast part and the anabolic part that, you know, it makes sense that, you know, the first or, you know, after a fast, if you've been fasting for even 12 to 16 hours, then your body is more responsive to the protein ingestion because you're switching from the fasted state to the fit state and your body tries to, you know, super compensate for the fasting to maintain the muscle tissue and build it. So, yeah, like that makes sense that your body is very sensitive to the anabolic amino acids after the fast. And what it would mean is that, yeah, like the the meal that you break your fast with should have, you know, the sufficient amount of protein and uh, the sufficient amount is generally like, you know, 30 grams is a good amount per meal for protein because you're going to get the 2.5 grams of leucine that maximizes the anabolic uh, protein synthesis in the muscle. And, uh, that ensures that you're just going to maintain the muscle tissue. It might be higher for the elderly people or might be lower for younger people, but, you know, 30 grams plus and minus 10 grams is kind of the gold standard per meal for protein. And when you look at the standard breakfasts, then, you know, they're usually not that high in protein. You know, the eggs and omelet and stuff like that are breakfast foods, but, you know, most people still don't eat 30 grams of protein uh, per meal. They might get 25 or 20 grams, but yeah, unless they're eating, yeah, like a low carb, health conscious uh, high protein meal then usually they're going to have like you know a lot of carbs which is fine from the insulin sensitivity perspective but you know it's still not uh, enough for the optimal uh, protein synthesis side yeah and i think a practical way to think about it that roughly works for a lot of people is a palm sized portion of protein that tends to contain about 30 grams of protein. So palm-sized portion of protein-rich foods, whether those are eggs or cheese or what have you. Mm. But like you say, the total leucine content on a per meal basis seems to be particularly important to trigger in the stimulation of muscle protein synthesis. The exact number is debated, 
but the relevance of this to the protein choices that you make is that different protein sources do differ substantially in their leucine contents mm. and in general animal source foods are much richer in leucine per gram of protein than plant source foods though there are some anomalies like corn which is very high in leucine but if you were consuming whey protein then you'd probably only need about 23 grams of whey protein to get enough leucine for most people bearing in mind what you said about the elderly and anabolic resistance whereas if somebody is on a plant-based diet let's say that they're a vegan their total daily protein intake arguably needs to be a bit higher because mm. they're going to be consuming less leucine. There's also the option to supplement with leucine. And I think this is a very interesting option for elderly individuals because what you often see with aging is that people become sarcopenic. They lose muscle to the point at which it negatively affects their lives. And that's in part due to that anabolic resistance that you mentioned earlier. But at the same time, they tend to lose their appetite and protein is very filling. So if you just tell them to eat more protein, then even if they can eat more protein, they might eat less in total, which is the opposite of what you want. Whereas if you can just have them supplement leucine at each meal, then they might be getting enough leucine on a per meal basis, but maybe without negatively affecting their total food intake each day. Just bear in mind that leucine tastes absolutely revolting. So it's, it's, it's always good if you can mask it in some way by mixing it in with other items. Yeah. You know, older people generally like to eat like bread and pastries and cookies. And, you know, they might eat a little bit of sausage or something, but they're really not eating yeah, high amounts of protein. And that's actually yeah, very worrisome in terms of the muscle maintenance side, but yeah, frailty side as well. Because if you just lose too much muscle and become too skinny as an elderly person, then yeah, like you might die to like fractures and uh, falls so yeah that's yeah you know, kind of supplementing some leucine i think is very important for an elderly person uh, for just maintaining the muscle tissue and keeping keeping the like the you know integrity of the entire body yeah and there are things that you can do to affect anabolic resistance so just being physically active for example seems to reduce the anabolic resistance that take place and just to define what that is it's just the fact that as people age, they tend to be less responsive to a given amount of protein ingestion. Mm. It seems to be less effective at triggering muscle protein synthesis, which is the main determinant of whether the total protein content of your muscles is increasing or decreasing over time. But physical activity can help ward off that anabolic resistance. And there seem to be some nutraceuticals that might also help one of which is the omega-3 fatty acids that you find in fish. Mm. So there's some work now, and I'm sure you're familiar with the scene, but showing that EPA and DHA, some combination of them, might help reduce this anabolic resistance. And you probably need a sufficient period of supplementation to realize this effect. So you probably need something like four weeks of supplementation, at maybe three grams or so per day of EPA and DHA. But just consuming enough oily fish as you age seems to be important to the health of your muscles when you might previously have thought that, yeah, it's really important to the health of my blood vessels and my brain, but it's key to so many of these different body systems. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what about from the evening side? So there are you know, some foods that contain melatonin that might help with sleep, uh, like you know, cherries and tart cherry juice is very known for that. Uh, what about, you know, is there any danger to consuming melatonin rich foods during the daytime when you shouldn't have like high amounts of melatonin in your blood and how would it affect like your insulin sensitivity or metabolic health, or should you only consume those melatonin foods, uh, in the evening and, and do they actually have any effect on sleep? What do you think? Yeah, that's a really good question. And in my opinion, the jury is currently out. What we do know is that consuming some of these phytomelatonin, so plant-based melatonin-rich foods, can promote healthy sleep in a lot of people. Much of that work has been on tart cherry concentrate or tart cherry juice, as you alluded to. And there are particular products that have been used a lot in research settings like Cherry Active. And that work has tended to show that 
taking about 30 milliliters of tart cherry concentrate a couple of times a day can improve some measures of sleep quality and duration in groups such as elderly individuals or older adults who have insomnia. It's not just tart cherries that have been studied. Some other melatonin containing foods like beef, steak, tomatoes might also be able to help sleep. There's been some work showing that a few hundred grams of those per day can improve sleep in older adults. I think one of the difficulties with this type of research is that when you're talking about supplementing with fruits or fruit concentrates or fruit juices, these items contain an enormous diversity of different chemicals. And so while some of this research has showed that there's some association between the degree to which these items increase levels of 6 alpha melatonin, which is the main metabolite of melatonin in the urine, and the improvements in their sleep, we don't really know that it is the phytomelatonin per se that's taking place that's contributing to these improvements when there are so many other compounds in these that could be having some beneficial effects. There are also some foods that contain higher quantities of phytomelatonin that haven't yet been studied. Based on the data that I've seen, pistachios have about the highest phytomelatonin concentration of any item that's been studied. You need a tiny amount of pistachios to get the equivalent of taking a, a modest dose of a melatonin supplement. You asked about consuming these during the daytime, and a lot of the epidemiology that's looked at consumption of things like fruits and vegetables and nuts that contain melatonin suggests that people consuming these during the day still experience some health benefits. So while taking a high dose of a melatonin supplement during the daytime wouldn't be a good idea for a lot of people, particularly if it was around the time of food intake, and there's been some work on that subject by Marta Garrelay and others, whether that's the case for these foods, I don't know. And honestly, I don't think that it's most people, it's something that most people should worry about. And just focusing on increasing their intake of plants is likely to produce some benefits. We also don't know whether people need to be taking things like tart cherry concentrate before bed to see those improvements in their sleep or whether consuming it earlier in the day can still be beneficial. And some of the work that's looked at tart cherry specifically has looked at it in relation to exercise performance. So often a dosing protocol would be 30 mils before exercise and then another 30 mils later in the day. And when people take it pre-exercise, they might experience some improvements in their exercise performance and some of the determinants of that performance, which is thought to be related to things like the antioxidant effects of some of the phytochemicals in tart cherries. Although obviously taking antioxidants before exercise isn't always a good thing. And it can actually hamper some exercise adaptations as has been shown in the case of some of the antioxidant vitamins and potentially N-acetylcysteine as well. So I think the jury is out, but in general, recommending that people consume tart cherries as a concentrate, as a drink, or as the cherries themselves, consume beef, steak, tomatoes, eat kiwis, they've also been studied for their effects on sleep, is unlikely to hurt their sleep and might well improve their sleep slightly. It's probably not just the melatonin contents of these foods that is improving sleep. And we really need a lot more research on whether it is melatonin that's exerting these positive effects, whether melatonin from these foods during the daytime is in any way problematic, and whether there is a best time of day at which to take them if people are looking for their effects on sleep specifically. Yeah, I guess that's a good good answer. And I agree that it's very unlikely that from the food you would, you know, somehow worsen your health by just consuming it at the daytime <laughs> with the, in regards to the melatonin content. But, you know, maybe from the health side, you know, first of all, these foods that contain melatonin are considered like healthy foods and the health outcomes of consuming those foods, like the lower 
risk of mortality and lower heart disease might be because they're just healthy, not because of the melatonin content. But yeah, like melatonin as a hormone or as a compound has a lot of these anti-inflammatory and antioxidant benefits as well. So yeah, like, you know, even if you consume them during daytime, then you might just help with uh, some aspects of the you know, redox balance and oxidative stress side, even if you, and you know, if you're eating them under sunlight or under whatever light, then you're still suppressing the melatonin from the, from the light exposure, if that makes sense. Yeah. And people are more physically active during the day and so on. So I don't think that there's any real cause for concern, but just going back to what I said about melatonin supplementation itself. And another comment that I made earlier that might be some interaction with people's genetics here mm. there's a common single nucleotide polymorphism so where a single letter in the dna code changes in a region that encodes one of the melatonin receptors that influences the degree to which melatonin affects insulin and therefore blood sugar mm. and for people with this common polymorphism which is associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes it could be that timing melatonin is relatively more important for these people it's particularly important to not consume lots of food and lots of carbohydrate in particular close to taking melatonin and so i wonder if this is also relevant in this conversation about the melatonin contents of food i think time will tell but if somebody took a genetic test and they found that they've got this common polymorphism the gene itself is the mtn r1b gene then for those individuals, it could make sense to actually favor a slightly shorter or smaller eating window than people without this polymorphism, because they're therefore ensuring that their food intake is further away from when their blood concentrations of melatonin are high, which are going to lead to greater blood sugar responses as a result of eating in those individuals. And so while I'm not generally bullish about the potential of these sort of nutri genetic and nutrigenomic approaches and personalizing people's nutrition based on SNPs. This is one of those cases where I think there might actually be a real application of people are taking these genetic tests when it comes to personalizing their nutrition. Hmm. Gotcha. Um, but what about, let's say the, the person who is doing shift work or something like that, and uh, they are awake a lot of the nighttime um and so how would they structure their meals like uh, should they still eat during the daytime and not eat anything at night or what's what's the like scenario in this yeah great question i'll mention something that i didn't touch on earlier just because it is relevant here and that is that, interestingly, you might expect that when people use early time restricted eating, they're ravenous later in the day, particularly because there's that circadian rhythm and appetite that I mentioned, such that appetite tends to peak in the evening. But that's actually the opposite of what happens. When people have used early time restricted eating for a period, they tend to have more even appetite over the course of the day. And they actually have a lower spike in their appetite in the evening. And so what this is suggesting is that using regular eating times can actually help with appetite control particularly if they're anchored relatively early in the waking day and so thinking about night shift work now based on what i said the recommendation might be to try and fix that eating window relatively early compared to people's shifts if they're doing night shifts and you might expect that that means that by the end of the night shift they're going to be very hungry but going back to that research that might not be the case. But being pragmatic, I think for these individuals, the important thing is using a regularly timed eating window each day. That's going to help maintain internal circadian alignment and buffer them against some of the effects of night shift work on things like blood sugar dysregulation, mood issues. And they can self-select when that window is. Sachin Panda did some work not long ago in firefighters showing that time-restricted eating is feasible in people who are working these types of unpredictable shift schedules. They can actually stick to it. So use the same recommendations that we discussed earlier, choose when that eating window is, but it probably, the time of the window probably shouldn't be that different from somebody who's just working day shifts. And then 
if you are going to snack outside of that window, because I recognize that that is likely to happen in these people, they are likely to spread out their food intake over a longer period than people who don't work shifts. Then I think the onus should be on choosing snacks that are relatively small. So probably ideally no more than about 10% of total daily energy intake. So if you're consuming 3000 calories a day, that'd be a snack of 300 calories or less, ideally. Choosing snacks that are high in protein. So going back to what we're discussing about skeletal muscle and appetite regulation, that's going to help with your metabolic control compared to consuming carbohydrate rich items, for instance. Maybe choosing snacks that contain some fiber. Again, that's going to help with appetite control and blood sugar control as well. And then choosing snacks that you personally find relatively easy to digest if that's relevant to your workplace performance. Because if you're consuming food during the biological nighttime, then your digestive system isn't necessarily anticipating that food intake. And so you're probably more likely to experience some gastrointestinal distress when you eat. So good snacks for these people might be things like protein shakes with a low glycemic load piece of fruit. So maybe, for example, you have protein shake with some berries. Might be something like cheese. It could be small amounts of yogurt or kefir. So I think generally a high protein item with a low sugar fruit or vegetable is going to be a, a good option. And then if you're looking for something that's tasty and rewarding, but also isn't going to lead to substantial metabolic dysregulation afterwards, then there are some things like protein bars out there now that aren't actually too bad. I have no affiliation with this company, but there's a Irish company named Eat All Real that makes protein bars that I really like. There aren't too many nasties in there, and that's not true of many protein bars that are out there. There are also some meat and fish-based bars out there nowadays that are really high quality. So jerky-type products, I think, are also really good options for these people. Hmm. Gotcha, yeah. So even if you do eat at night, then you know, try not to eat donuts, but make it healthier. Yeah. And the food environment is so important for these people. We go to the workplace and we don't have as much control over that as we do in our home environments. So if we're surrounded by cake and donuts and pastries, then we're more likely to reach for them, especially if we're short on sleep and therefore disposed to choosing small soon rewards over larger later ones. Mm -hmm. So I think people who are high up in shift work organizations should be looking to try and improve the food environments of people who are working at these institutions to try and support their health. And that could mean having conversations with canteens, making sure that there are vending machines that are well stocked with healthy items, giving people access to fruits and vegetables. So having bowls of fruit, for example, some simple change like that could meaningfully improve the health and well-being of these individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about like completely fasting at night um, or, you know, a ketogenic or being in ketosis because, you know, ketones have a lot of these neuroprotective effects and stuff like that. So um, would they also help from the, the negative side effects of the shift work? Yeah, quite possibly. So re regarding the ketones, it's a really interesting subject and I'm keen to look more closely at the research on this when I have time. But there has been a bit of work recently suggesting that ketogenic diets can help protect people against some of the negative neurocognitive effects of insufficient sleep. So if you think about these shift workers who are undergoing circadian disruption and sleep loss, not everyone who does shifts undergoes this sleep loss, but a lot of people do, particularly certain stages of sleep. Then maybe the ketogenic diet is going to be particularly helpful in these individuals especially if they already have some sort of metabolic dysregulation. Following on from that, it would be interesting to see whether some of these ketone supplements can help out too. But frankly, when I look at the effects of these products based on the data to date compared to other supplements that cost a small fraction of their price, I wouldn't recommend them particularly quickly compared to some of the alternatives that are out there. On the subject of coping with insufficient sleep, I also think this is another example where creatine monohydrate comes into its own. Mm. And seen, we've probably spoken about this previously, but 
just briefly creating seems to help people better cope with insufficient sleep too there are reasons to think it also might actually slightly reduce sleep need and also the depth of sleep which you might assume would be negative but doesn't seem to be based on the research to date so going by the many benefits of creatine and the very modest downsides which basically just the cost of it for most people then supplementing creatine monohydrate probably just roughly five grams a day for most individuals it's not really clear whether it needs to scale to body weight but you could take something like one gram per 10 kilos of body weight or half to one gram half a gram to one gram per 10 kilos of body weight per day just take that with your breakfast that might help protect you against some of these shift work associated health issues and performance issues mm, gotcha. and then regard sorry regarding fasting I'd probably be slower to recommend extended fasting. When I say extended fasting, I'm not referring to just using time-restricted eating in general. But I think that a lot of people say, I feel great when I go on these extended fasts and I seem to experience all sorts of beneficial effects and I feel really sharp cognitively. But I don't think that subject has been very well studied. The brain is a very energetically hungry organ and if anything, I think it tends to perform better when it has some nutrients available. So I think stick to time-restricted eating, whether you're a shift worker or not, but I would probably be less likely to recommend extended fast to these individuals. And when I say that, I'm talking about fast of 24 hours or longer. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like more like not eating at all during the night shift. So like you, you still eat like a dinner or something and then you fast all throughout the night and then you eat breakfast or something like that. Yeah, and I, I think I think that can work well. And that work that I mentioned by Frank Shear earlier, the way that the experiment was designed was such that sometimes people were eating immediately before a block of sleep. Sometimes they were eating in the middle of a block of sleep. And then sometimes they were eating straight after the block of sleep to maintain that daytime eating schedule during simulated night shifts. And even though the food intake coincide with the sleep period these people still experience the benefits so this, the implication of that is that if you're working night shifts and you're trying to stick to time restricted eating there might be some circumstances where you are eating immediately before or immediately after your sleep and then you're having these extended fast during the night shift but you might still experience some benefits because of that when in other circumstances in which people are working day shifts you might expect that to be counterproductive mm, gotcha uh, so what about like uh, supplements so how how should you you know take supplements in regards to the circadian rhythms and like what's the best time to do that relevant to this is the field of chronopharmacology and the idea behind chronopharmacology is that if we can better understand the best times of day at which to take drugs particularly when combined with an understanding of somebody's biological rhythms and their chronotype, whether they're a morning lark or a night owl, then we might be able to use lower doses of drugs and reduce the side effects of drugs and reduce the costs of providing people with medicines and also the costs of the side effects that result from taking them. And this is relevant to supplements too, because the processes of absorbing, distributing, metabolizing, and excreting drugs are also very relevant to nutraceuticals too, of course. And frankly, many nutraceuticals are very similar in their effects to drugs. So take the example of berberine and metformin. The ways by which they're acting and their actual effects seem to largely overlap with each other. And interestingly, when you look at many of the most popular in terms of use drugs, they act on pathways that are regulated by the circadian clock. And in this field of research, we now know that there are lots of drugs that yield better results when taken at certain times of day. For example, there are some medications that are used for cancer. And there are also some forms of radiation therapy 
that result in better outcomes when administered in the morning than later in the day. There are other drugs that are better administered later on. So for example, if you look at arthritis, then many arthritis symptoms flare in the evening and around bedtime. And maybe people, people also have some stiffness on waking in the morning. And a lot of these arthritis medications, like some glucocorticoids, are best taken around bedtime. There are also blood pressure lowering drugs that are better taken shortly before bedtime because there's a particular high blood pressure, hypertension phenotype in which there isn't the usual drop in overnight blood pressure that should take place. They're called non-dippers and they seem to be particularly at increased risk of various different cardiovascular health issues. And so for these people taking their blood pressure, lowering medications right around the end of the waking day can help ensure that their blood pressure does dip overnight and can then improve their outcomes down the line. And so my guess is that all of this is relevant to supplements too, and that we will get to the point at which we understand that there are best times at which to take some supplements. Right now, though, it's the Wild West, and we really don't know when it's best to take many different supplements throughout there. But I think that we can choose some obvious examples and maybe some slightly less obvious examples too to drill home this point. So in terms of the obvious examples, there are some products that are out there that can disrupt physiology that strongly cycles. So think of your sleep-wake cycle. You wouldn't want to take a strong stimulant shortly before bedtime. So stimulatory supplements, obviously there are things like caffeine, are going to generally be best taken in the morning because they're unlikely to affect sleep later at night. And in the case of sleep-promoting supplements, and those might include things like melatonin, of course, but also melatonin containing foods and drinks, things like ashwagandha, things like L-theanine. Maybe L-theanine is not the best example because it also is used for its nootropic effects. But a lot of those are going to be best taken in the evening, maybe shortly before bed, in order to support sleep health. But then maybe there are other supplements that we'll find are best taken at certain times of day. And one of the only examples of this that I've seen is there's some work looking at differences in responses to curcumin taken at different times of day with regards to its effects on cancer, suggesting that there might be better times of day at which to take it. And curcumin is enormously potent in many ways. But thinking about supplements that might be relevant to some of the people tuning into this, Seem, I know that you've spoken a lot about glynac, glycine and NAC, if you look at synthesis of glutathione each day, then there seems to be a peak, I believe, in the afternoon. And so maybe it makes sense to try and support the amplitude of that peak. And we'll find out that there's a disruption in that glutathione synthesis rhythm in some forms of dysfunction. And so it could be that taking glycine and NAC at certain times of day is better than at other times of day. Or if you think about some other supplements that are popular among people who are interested in longevity, some of these supplements target pathways such as NAD recycling and AMP kinase. And these are pathways that are both affected by the circadian clock, but also in turn affect the circadian clock. And so it could be that there are best times of day at which to take supplements such as nicotinamide, riboside, NMN, and some of these pathways that target some of these supplements that target the AMPK pathway. Resveratrol will be among those, but obviously that is a subject that is hotly contested because of some dubious research on resveratrol. Right. So we'll see about what the best times of day we should take these supplements are, but I think there's every reason to think that there will be many supplements out there that are substantially better when taken at certain times of day, particularly mm. when we understand the timing of someone's body clock. Sorry, that wasn't a very helpful answer, but hopefully it frames the question. Yeah, you know, I, you know, it depends a lot on the the type of the supplement and um, like mechanism by which it works. Like, you know, like you said, melatonin, obviously you want to take that before bed, not in the morning and caffeine. Also, you want to take that earlier in the day rather than later. 
And uh, yeah, there are, you know, a few examples that I've also seen for these different supplements, like with regards to the NAD boosters, then there are like some, at least in like a mouse study, they found that taking the, or boosting NAD with a supplement at the uh, mice biological daytime. So for them at nighttime, earlier in the start of the active phase, that resulted in like some increase in lifespan or so like health benefits but if they took or administered the nad increase at their biological night time then actually they live shorter so there might be some important aspect of when you raise your nad because you know naturally nad levels do rise in the early part of the biological active active period so for humans it would be like earlier in the morning and uh, early you know, at least before noon rather than at night time so i think you know it makes sense to not take NAD before bedtime. You would want to take it, you know, in the active part. So ideally, like earlier in the active phase. Yeah, there are a few more things to mention too, I think. One of them is that the timing of, the importance of timing of these supplements and medications probably in part depends on the pharmacokinetics of them. Mm. And what I mean by that is whether, for example, they have, relatively fast acting effects or longer lasting effects, whether they have short half-lives or long half-lives, because if something has a long half-life and it stays in your system for, let's say more than 24 hours, when you take it is less likely to be important. But if it's very fast acting, then when you take it, it's probably going to be more important. There are also interactions with things like when you engage in certain lifestyle activities. So I mentioned earlier that taking high doses of antioxidant vitamins like vitamin C before exercise can hamper some of the adaptations that you see in response to exercise like mitochondrial biogenesis. And so it could be that with some of these supplements, there's a best time to take them when everything else is controlled and somebody is being sedentary, for example. But we also find out that if the best time is the morning, but then if you take them before exercise, then they blunt the responses to the exercise and somebody can only exercise in the morning, then all of a sudden the best time which to take it shifts, if that makes sense. So there are all these different interactions that are at play, but that doesn't detract from the point that there probably is a best time of day at which to take many of these. Another final comment is that we have to meet people where they are and understand that a lot of people just forget to take their supplements. And so there could be an optimal time at which to take them, but absent, for example, technologies that can help people stick to these optimal dosing schedules. So maybe those are things like notifications delivered via a smartphone. The important thing is that people do take them for many of them. And so a lot of people, maybe they are used to taking supplements either at the start of the day or the end of the day. And so you might think about using a simpler approach where there are, there are two periods each day in which you take supplements as opposed to, oh, this one's best at 9 a.m. and this one's at 1 p.m. and this one's at 6 p.m., if that makes sense. Yeah, and with the antioxidants, then correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, the the antioxidant activity kind of rises, yeah, like before bed or your body is using these antioxidants or you're conducting conducting these repair processes in your sleep. So would it make sense to, like, you know, take the antioxidants before sleep to like help with in conjunction with melatonin and stuff like that yeah i i don't know this is something that i thought about years ago and that i haven't reconsidered recently at all but one of the effects of extended wakefulness is a general increase in oxidative stress because when you're awake you're more active many different metabolic pathways are in higher gear than they are during sleep as a result of that increase in oxidative stress there's more damage and Interestingly, oxidative stress per se does seem to affect sleep needs. And so there's some research on non-human animals suggesting that taking high doses of certain antioxidants might actually affect sleep need, so might slightly reduce sleep need, and might also counter some of the deleterious effects of insufficient sleep. And some of the antioxidants that have been studied include things like NAD. So I actually think that it's plausible that some of these antioxidants could mildly promote wakefulness, in which case it could be that a better time of day at which to take them is the morning. But then also going back to what we were discussing about tart cherry juice, that's full of antioxidant compounds and that seems to be best taken shortly before bed. Well, we don't know that, but certainly 
when people take it shortly before bed, they seem to, if anything, experience improved sleep. So again, we need more research on it. And I think you could probably argue either way regarding whether it's better to take them early in the day or later in the day. But regardless, the optimal timing is probably going to vary depending on factors such as the antioxidant in question, the desired effect, and the tissue in question too, because obviously these don't end up in all tissues at similar concentrations. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it depends a lot. <laughs> uh, what about the creatine? So like you mentioned that it has like benefits for reducing sleep demand and helping to mitigate sleep loss. So would you take it like before bed or on, in, only in, in the context of sleep and brain function? Like, of course, there's better times to take it for the exercise performance. But if you were to take creatine for the sleep side, would you take it like either before a bad sleep or uh, after you had bad sleep? I personally, were I trying to use creatine to mitigate some of the negative effects of poor sleep or insufficient sleep, would probably use creatine loading. And that's in part because a lot of the research that's been done on this subject has used creatine loading. Often it's something like five grams per dose, dosed four times per day over five to seven days before some block of sleep deprivation or sleep restriction. And I would therefore be doing things somewhat in accordance with the relevant research. But creatine doesn't get stored in all tissues at the same rate. And in humans, the process of getting creatine into the brain isn't that straightforward. So whereas in rats, for instance, if you supplement their chow with creatine monohydrate, you can increase their brain creatine stores by over 30%. In humans, the magnitude of that effect is probably substantially smaller, probably less than 10%. So it could be that in order to substantially raise brain creatine levels, you need to use a substantially higher dose than you would use for something like skeletal muscle. And given that high doses of creatine can cause gastrointestinal disturbances because of its osmotic properties, it probably makes sense to split the high dose of creatine into several doses per day. So just being pragmatic to avoid danger pants. If you're going to take 20 grams of creatine per day, you probably want to take five grams four times a day or something like that. Obviously, it depends on the individual's tolerance, but going back to what you're asking I, I think what that means is that you're probably actually going to be using it at more or less every meal regardless if you're trying to push up your brain creatine stores as high as possible and ward off some of those effects of poor sleep and then whether you can just use short-term creatine loading and then maintain brain creatine stores with a maintenance dose of say five grams we, we don't currently know but hopefully a lot of people listening to this won't need to undergo long-term sleep restriction. And so if you just know that there's a period coming up, let's say that you have seven days in which your sleep is going to be very disrupted, I think a reasonable approach would be to use five days of creatine loading in anticipation of that, and then maybe use half that loading dose or so during the actual disruptive phase itself. Regarding newborn parents and newborns who are undergoing sleep disruption for let's say six months or longer what you could do is you could use creatine loading before that and then just take a higher dose of creatine than you normally would so maybe you take 10 grams per day as opposed to five grams per day split in two doses and i don't think that the timing of those two doses would matter too much regarding timing of creatine it does seem to be better taken up when combined with things like carbohydrate and protein so having it with meals is probably better than having it on an empty stomach. So I don't know if that's helpful, Seem, but we really don't understand the answer to that question very well just yet. Right. But the important point is that my guess is that to get more creatine into the brain, we do need higher doses, and then that's going to necessitate taking it multiple times per day. Mm, gotcha. Well, that's a good, <laughs> good answer. Um, yeah, I think that we covered pretty much everything, at least what I had in mind 
or the questions that I had. So uh, yeah, I think it's very kind of thorough and insightful. Is there anything else that you want to add in terms of chrono nutrition, chrono pharmacology supplements? The only thing that comes to mind immediately is that going back to what I said earlier about people with various different forms of dysfunction. So someone has diabetes and they've got some abnormalities in their circadian rhythms. Another way by which we can potentially use things like supplements to improve the health of these people is by actually improving their clock function itself. And there's now a little bit of research on some of these so-called clock enhancing molecules. And a salient example of this would be melatonin. If someone has a disrupted sleep-wake cycle, let's say they've got a frank circadian rhythm sleep-wake disorder, like non-24 hour sleep-wake rhythm disorder, where their clock is basically just running at its own pace. And sometimes they're on time with the world around them, but sometimes they're not. Taking melatonin can basically help improve their clock function, keep their sleep-wake timing at regular intervals and probably improve their responses to many of these other things that we've discussed too, like chrononutrition. So for somebody who has a dysfunctional clockwork, improving the function of the clock is probably going to enhance their responses to other interventions that are based on an understanding of chronobiology. And I think we're going to see more and more of these clock enhancing compounds over time. Probably the only one that's been relatively well studied albeit in non-human animals so far is a flavonoid named nobilitin you find it in citrus peels and that's really interesting because it's something that is part of people's diets already and if you can take that and you can improve someone's clock function and then improve their responses to many of these other chronotherapeutic interventions then that i think will be a really attractive proposition for many people and then for somebody who has a functional clock already we can then start to make some changes based on the other things that we discussed too. So optimal timing of food and take and so on. Mm. So I'll just end by adding that we also just want to think about improving the function of the clock per se, and that's going to amplify the beneficial effects of other interventions. And I think we're going to be able to improve the function of the clock in the future through timely use of some of these clock enhancing molecules. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. But, you know, let's say a person tries to realign their clocks. So, you know, obviously we talked in the previous episode, we talked all about the light and general alignment, but kind of having like a you know good breakfast and uh, caffeine intake earlier in the day and then stopping food intake before bed and, you know, maybe supporting the sleep with some melatonin supplementation or melatonin in these foods. That's a way you kind of realign the clock again back to like a normal setting. Yeah, absolutely. So really fundamentally what we're speaking about is getting plenty of daylight during the day, having dark evenings, eating during the waking day and being physically active at that time too. And that brings me to the final thing that I mentioned today, which is just that this is all relevant to exercise too. And there's this now emerging field of chrono exercise, which is looking at the importance of exercise timing in people's responses to that exercise. And to cut to the chase, it generally points to the idea that exercising in the biological afternoon seems to be most beneficial for a lot of people. There might be some modest sex differences, although that hasn't been well demonstrated just yet. But this is both true of acute performance and the exercise performance in strength and power tasks in particular, but possibly also in intermittent activities and endurance tasks tends to be higher in the biological afternoon. So probably around 6 p.m. for a lot of people. This is also true of metabolic health. There's been some work showing that in people with poor blood sugar control, if they regularly do interval exercise by way of cycling in the afternoon, then that will improve their blood sugar control as assessed by continuous glucose monitoring. But if they regularly do it in the morning, that can actually acutely worsen their blood sugar control. So in general, the best time of day for high intensity exercise seems to be the afternoon, but obviously I would always encourage people to exercise. And at other times of day, we always want to break up our periods of sitting with intermittent activity. So going for short walks after meals, for instance. Gotcha. Yeah. Interesting. I, I saw uh, like two studies 
2022 and 2023 that show that earlier moderate physical activity so that's you know any, that can be any, anything that is not super intense but getting like over 50 percent of your moderate physical activity into in the hours of 5 a.m to 11 a.m versus in the evening and and at night time is associated with lower mortality and lower cardiovascular disease you know obviously if you like have to work work out in the evening or at, at night time then chances are you're also doing shift work which would also just mean that you have worse health outcomes because of the circadian disruption uh, but you know humans are also supposed to like move in the early part of the day not like immediately before bed so you want to have like a buffer zone before bed the same way you do with uh, eating to not you know do a lot of uh <laughs> vigorous uh you know exercise right before bed yeah absolutely and i think regarding strenuous exercise roughly the same timing rules apply so i would avoid it in the one hour after waking up and in the three hours before bedtime for very different reasons and i won't go into those now but while the afternoon might be best in terms of performance and metabolic health for very strenuous exercise, we should be distributing low and moderate intensity activity over the course of the rest of the waking day. And going back to what you were saying, if you think about people who are doing a substantial amount of low or moderate intensity exercise in the first third or half of the waking day, and that being associated with better long-term health outcomes, then people who are more active at that time of day are probably going to be getting more daylight exposure at that time of day, for example. And then that's going to help anchor their body's clocks early in the day. So they're going to be falling asleep earlier. So they're going to have a longer sleep opportunity. And so their sleep is going to be better. And so it's one of these instances where the conclusion of the study might be being active early in the day is best, but whether the positive effects of that activity are mediated by the activity per se, or some of these confounding variables like daytime light exposure or daylight exposure is questionable. I don't know if that makes sense, but mm, yeah, for sure. Uh, just you know, don't exercise at night when you're supposed to sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's a fair summary. <laughs> uh, all right, well, that was an amazing overview, and yeah, I'm super excited to have you here. Great, thanks, Sim. Yeah, I'll uh, see you around. And where where can people find your work and uh, your channels? Yeah, so. Thanks for the opportunity to mention those. I actually have a YouTube channel now, which is at Greg Potter PhD. And at the moment, it's still just my own podcast, but I'm going to be adding non-podcast content to it. The name of that podcast is Reason and Wellbeing. And you can find that where you can find any podcast, so Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and so on. And I've just completed the first season of that podcast, but we've already covered many subjects including circadian biology sleep physical activity nutrition so please do check that out and then otherwise you can follow me on instagram at greg potter phd and if you have any questions related to what we've discussed today then please do ping me a message there that's good we'll put the links in the show notes and uh, yeah i'll see you around thanks Steve. but do you want to achieve and maintain biological youth if yes then i'm looking for more people who want to add healthy years to their life if you're interested, then email me the word health to info at and I'll send you the details.